Hello there, and thank you for tuning in to see what the world looks like through atheist eyes. I'm Frank Zindler from American Atheist Press, and the atheist eyes through which you'll be viewing the world again today are my eyes. Today's program is a story of how a remarkable young woman named Rebecca Williams converted herself from fundamentalist Latin mass Catholic into an evolutionary skeptic. She did that by reading Christian evolutionists, such as Francis Collins and Kenneth Miller. Appropriately, our program today is titled, Rebecca Williams, From Latin Mass Catholic to Darwinian Skeptic. Let's join the conversation. About a year ago, I had the pleasure of attending a uh, meeting, an atheist meetup of a group called omnipresent atheists. They meet at a uh, uh, watering place, you might call it, uh, for entertainment and discussion, everything from quantum mechanics to genetic engineering and uh, literary problems and just what's the best beer. About a year ago, when I first started going to those meetups, a young woman uh, was <laughs> There, she was apparently more expert than I was. Uh, her name is Rebecca Williams, and uh, we uh, had some really amazing conversations, uh, despite the din of the venue and passing traffic. They have an outdoor uh, uh, garden restaurant sort of a thing, as well as the indoor part. and. Uh, uh, she's read an amazing amount of good stuff, and she's also read a bunch of stuff that we agree is trash. <laughs> but um, her story is very interesting. Uh, if it weren't, I wouldn't have her on this show. But I think that her story is one that uh, needs to be shared with all of the atheists out there, and if there are some true believers out there, and there probably are, who are also watching this show to, to see if the atheists have anything on the ball at all or not, uh, I think it's interesting for our viewers, Rebecca, uh, to have some understanding of how you started out and how in the world you ended up being a heretic like me. Um, but before we do that, I want to say it's a pleasure to have yes, you on likewise. this show. Uh, <laughs> forgive my bad manners. I just jumped into it and, and forgot to thank you for being on my show. But anyway, uh, Rebecca, tell us a bit, anyway, of, about your interesting upbringing and your education and, and, and give us that background. And, and then we'll get into the question of how you began to question and how you got out of all of this. So sure. take it away. <laughs> <laughs> and I want to start by saying I had no idea who Frank Zindler was when we first <laughs> met. I'd never heard the name before. But since then, like you introduced me to Christ mythicism. Yeah. And that was really interesting. But my story, starting out really back at the beginning, I went to Catholic school from kindergarten and then in second grade, during my first communion preparation, my parents decided that this school was not Catholic enough. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, and, we're in trouble now. Right. And they, they let me, they had us finish out that year. It was me and my brother still in that school. He was a little older. And they had us finish out that year, but my first communion was actually for the longest time, the first time, the last time I had been to English Mass. Wow. The church that my parents switched to was the only church in their diocese that still had the Trinitine Latin Mass. Yeah, uh, for our viewers who are not Catholic, uh, after the um, Second Vatican Council, uh, the local Catholic churches in all countries uh, gave up doing the hocus pocus in Latin, and right. the mass was thereafter uh, celebrated in all of the indigenous languages. And right. so, uh, what Rebecca is telling us is that she, her Catholic family was very, very fundamentalist. 
Right. In fact, almost heretical. I think. Uh, I think well, wasn't the leader of the of the Latin group the French cardinal? What was his name? Wasn't he excommunicated actually by the Pope? Well, or? they weren't part of the same. Oh, Pius that wasn't the same. Group. Okay. Okay. But they were. They agreed with a lot of the same ideals. Uh huh. Yeah. But then, for like eight years, I was homeschooled, and then I went to a Catholic high school. Mm -hmm. Um, but then in college is really when I started learning more, is how I would put it. And tell us what college this was? Bowling Green State University. Okay, a good so, state school. Yeah, it was, it was close to home is mainly why I picked I it. I see. Okay, well, that, that <laughs> helps too. Yeah. Because I was, I was and still kind of am pretty close to my parents mm -hmm. and have a lot of nephews because Catholic family. <laughs> In fact, uh, I should tell our viewers a debate that I did uh, at Bowling Green University is on, on this channel. It's called The Question of God, I think is the title. I will have it. to check that out. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I don't remember uh, that. It, it was uh, me against three other believers, and uh, I was supposed to defend uh, uh, Freud and uh, atheism, and they were, all, of course, all defending C.S. Lewis. So, right. Anyway, <laughs> but that's, so, uh, Bowling Green, a good school. Okay, go on. Yeah, I liked my experiences there a lot. So, around, it was summer of 2009, actually, I started a series of notes on Facebook, which is sort of the beginner blog, I guess. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And what I was trying to do was prove that reason and evidence led to traditional Catholicism. Mm -hmm. I made the error, I guess, of starting with evolution. Okay. Because I'd been taught growing up based on, well, really humane generis, um, which, let's sidetrack a little bit, humane yes. generis. Yes, tell us what an encyclical <laughs> is. And, and Right, so an encyclical is a letter from the Pope to all the Catholics, or I think to all the bishops. To all the bishops, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. and actually I believe the letters after the Gospels in the New Testament are all considered encyclicals. Hmm. Yeah, I guess in, literally they were, because they were supposed to circulate. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um... Uh, at least the ones by Peter. Would yeah, be yeah. Or attributed. To Attribu Peter. Yes, like, please, please. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> attributed to Peter, yes. Right. Okay. So those ones, so an encyclicals like that is a letter from the Pope. And the one from Pope Pius XII in 1952 was Humane Generis or the Origin of Human Life. Mm -hmm. And in it, to sum up, he basically said, belief in evolution is fine for Catholics. But. But <laughs> you have to believe in a literal Adam and Eve. Yeah. He used the term polygenism. Polygenism, yeah. Thank polygenism. you. Yeah. Um, but he did not mean by that what a biologist no, would mean. No, because no. a biologist would mean, uh, I think, a defunct theory <laughs> that <laughs> humans magically rose in different parts of the world yeah, instead yeah, of just yeah, in Africa. Right, right, yeah, yeah. But in Catholicism, polygenism means literal, the belief that there wasn't a literal Adam and Eve. Well, yeah, there, there, there were many ancestors. Right. Uh, to start with. I mean, right. you know, that, yeah, uh, it doesn't, even that doesn't make much sense, but, <laughs> but the point is, yes, no Adam and Eve, there was a whole population. Right. Yeah, that was the thing. Right. So in 2009, I was doing this trying to prove evolution is false on Facebook, which is just <laughs> crazy. But I was young. <laughs> and I had two friends in particular who, I think they were both in college for biology at the time. One might have graduated. He might have been in graduate school. But they got on there and they were like, no, you are wrong. And here is why you are wrong. And... One of these friends actually was from my home parish. Hmm. He'd been homeschooled also. Wow. And I remember at some point talking with my family about these discussions I was having, and they said, but he should know better. And it didn't make a lot of sense. They did, these two friends, they recommended one book each. One of the friends was attending the same college I was. He recommended 
the language of God by Francis Collins. Ah, right. Yes. And the human genome sequencer for the right. public team, yes. Yeah, he was... And that was a pretty good book. Mm -hmm. um, that book I read, it was... I was finishing it around Christmas vacation. So I know I was reading it at some point in really early January. And there's a page in that book that has the illustration of the ape chromosomes mm -hmm. and the human chromosomes showing the fusion yes, from yes. two to one. Right, yeah. And that was so earth-shattering to yeah. me. Yeah, it was very graphic yeah. for me, too, when I yeah. first saw how all the chromosomes match up and, and the fusion of the two, the, the, the right. chimp and the gorilla have 48 and we only have 46. And we can actually right. trace from the stains of the bands on the chromosomes that two of the ape chromosomes fused to form yeah. one of ours. Yeah. And seeing that illustration was really powerful. I had to put the book down. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and digest this new fact. And I remember thinking um, that maybe these evolutionists, I don't know if I use that term, but maybe these evolutionists actually have some evidence on their side. Mm -hmm. And that was the first time that mm -hmm. I had ever thought that. Mm -hmm. And then a few months later, I read the book recommended by the other guy, mm -hmm. the other biologist. And that was Finding Darwin's God, okay. which I brought a copy of. So Yeah, we'll, 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 we'll fly we'll a copy of a cover of this on the but screen. But I've so actually you marked, it, but you can kind yeah, of Yeah, how see. about that? You've got it all indexed <laughs> and, and, and marked. These are so. all of the places in this book that show a piece of, evol piece of evidence for evolution. Yeah, most people <laughs> put index tabs like that in their Bibles so that it can quickly right. get to <laughs> Do you yeah. worship that book? <laughs> no, but it changed my life. <laughs> okay. So that was that one piece of evidence that I found in the Language of God by Francis Collins. That didn't quite convince me, but it opened my mind enough. And this book just threw mm -hmm. wide the door. Mm -hmm. And then I had mm -hmm. to accept evolution as true. By the way, this is uh, by Kenneth Miller, who is a very famous Catholic evolutionary debater. That is to say, he's, despite the fact that he's Catholic, he has been active in debating the more notorious um, creationists uh, over the years. And uh, he had several absolutely devastating debates uh, against Henry Morris and Dwayne Gish. But of course, I defeated Gish too in <laughs> two debates. But, <laughs> but I had to. Uh, give Miller credit that he uh, certainly, I, I think, very, very soundly trounced all of his opponents. He was very, very skilled. He is yeah, very skilled in the He does debate. the same thing in this book. He yeah. goes through and he says this, this intelligent design theory is, or yeah. hypothesis is yeah. wrong. Yeah. And this is why. This is the evidence that shows it is wrong and why yeah. we know that evidence says that. Now, Ken still thinks, though, that you can be a good Catholic and accept the reality of evolutionary right. science. Right, and actually the whole point of this book is to show that that is true. Yeah, and, and did he show that? And it's very interesting, like you can see, you might not be able to see, but you can, you can see <laughs> yeah. that about the first half of this book, there's a bunch all of the evidence. Tabs. <laughs> and then about the second half is just... Nothing. <laughs> just him trying to... Con try to convey that... To reconcile this. Yeah. yeah to try yeah. to show Christianity can totally make sense. Mm -hmm. And even when I first read it, that those arguments were just unconvincing. They seem specious. Yeah. Yeah. They didn't... And I actually reread the book, I think, last year at some point, And I found not only were... Did they... The logic doesn't quite fit. Mm -hmm. But... He doesn't actually address the question yeah. of yeah. how do you account for suffering with... Right, right. Yeah, yeah, because Christianity explains suffering by Adam and Eve's sin. Yeah, yeah. But if there's millions of years before Adam and Eve... Now, tell me uh, and tell our viewers just why, why do Christians need Adam and Eve? And that's because... Without Adam and Eve, there's no original sin. Without original sin, there's no reason for Jesus Christ to die. Yeah, there's there's no need to be redeemed. Right. And so, no need for a redeemer. Right. And that and puts J.C. out of business. I think it's Paul that says that 
as there was one through one man, humankind fell. Yeah. Through one man, humankind is raised. That's right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So you can't have Adam. You can't have no Adam and Eve. Yeah. Now, um, you know, Christian liberals such as the Catholic liberal Kenneth uh, Miller and Francis Collins and Francis too. Collins. Yes. Um, they, you know, seem to think that uh, you can uh, believe in evolution. I say believe in it. You can accept evolution. Right. Uh, and still be a Christian. But how can they get around this simple logic that you've just uh, expressed? Uh, I mean, the fundamentalists and the atheists agree, as you told me. <laughs> right. We, both my family members and I still agree that Christianity and evolution are incompatible. Are incompatible, <laughs> yes, yes. They and, contradict. Uh, um, is it, do they have some kind of symbolism that they're thinking this is all I can't or? really explain the liberal Christian argument. Yeah, because I've never, I've never could never figure expected, it out either. I've never accepted it. Yeah. Um, I think symbolism is part of it. I think a lot of it is they just take it on faith. Yeah, yeah. Which yeah. does... Honestly, even when I was at my most fundamentalist, before I started this journey, um, even then, I would, I would say, I don't believe in God. I know he exists. Because to me, it was a matter of knowledge and not belief. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And now I feel that way about evolution. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, now, uh, Rebecca, you told me before the program began that um, that many atheists, when they criticize religion, uh, the Christians who are hearing feel that they are being attacked, that they're yes. personally being attacked, and this uh, develops a sort of resistance in them to even listening. Would you elaborate on that? I haven't expressed that at all coherently. I, <laughs> our, our viewers, I think, need to know this. Okay, so actually a part of my story that I left out, obviously I left out a lot because I just summed up 20 years. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. A part of my story I left out is one of those two biologist friends of mine recommended Why Evolution is True by Jerry Coyne. And I did start that book. Mm-hmm. I believe my bookmark in that book is still in the same place. <laughs> <laughs> Mine. I got, I, I want to say like maybe a chapter and a half into it and I just uh-huh. quit reading it. I couldn't continue because I looked up the author and I found out, oh, he's an anti-theist. Uh-huh. So I can't <laughs> say for certain what I was thinking, but it might have been along the lines of, well, maybe Satan is trying, is using him. Because mm-hmm, mm-hmm. that's the sort of thing fundamentalists think. Sure, and sure. in their worldview, that makes complete sense. Yeah, yeah. So, when I, the reason I like to tell, especially finding Darwin's God so much, is because this guy is a Christian. This is a safe read for fundamentalists because he's not trying to convince you that God's not real. Yeah, yeah. Um, how should. How should atheist activists such as myself uh, proceed? Um, Do, I mean, obviously, what changed you was not a book by an atheist. It it was a book by a believer um, who was falsely claiming (laughs) that you could be both an evolutionist and a Christian. Um, Is there any hope for somebody who's Aware, self-aware as an atheist and trying to explain to other people, is there any hope for us to try to get people to reason or do we have to cook up something that is fallacious in order to get people to open their minds to start? Well, I think it, a lot of it depends on the person. Yeah. For sure. Like, this strategy definitely worked on me. Mm-hmm. I don't think anyone in my life was trying to make me become an atheist at that point. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, but it that is what happened. Yeah, yeah. Um, for some people, just nothing's going to work. Sure. Some fundamentalists will stay fundamentalists no matter what you do. 
But something to keep in mind is just because somebody's a fundamentalist, just because they don't accept evolution, doesn't mean they're an idiot. No, absolutely. I, I like to remind people, well, I didn't magically become smart because yeah. I accepted evolution. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, right, yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah. you have to sort of be willing to treat them with a level of respect. Sure, yeah. And meet them, like, intellectually on this, on that level. I, I think one of the points you made, though, is important that in our interactions with believers we have to be scrupulous not to give any possible uh, indication that we are attacking the person, that we are at right. hominem, that we have to stick to the theoretical issues and uh, uh, not only avoid any obvious ad hominem, like, well, how can you be so dumb? <laughs> I didn't believe that. Right. Uh, I mean, that's the obvious thing. And it is. But it is really easy to slip into thinking that, oh, those creationists, they're so stupid. Yeah, how could yeah. think that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because evolution, once you have recognized it as true, right. is really right. obvious. Yeah. I, I often have thought that, uh, in fact, in my red books, I have um, at least one chapter called Why is Religiosity so Hard to Cure? And part of my thesis is that religious ideas were not acquired by means of logic and reasoning and so on. They were acquired more like post-hypnotic suggestions are acquired. Uh, they are the result of suggestion when we are at a very uh, suggestible age. Right. And under circumstances when we are more suggestible than at other times of day and things like this. Right. And mm -hmm. because it was, these beliefs were acquired in a non-logical setting, in a non-logical process, uh, therefore they are relatively impermeable uh, to logic unless there's something that suddenly can get in, whether it's a... Uh, uh, a psychological trauma of some sort right. that, you know, you, m you mentioned the problem of evil and we want to get to that before we end this show. Um, yes. But, uh, you know, whether it's something horrible happening that suddenly wakes the person up and mm -hmm. they begin to be able to look at logic and so on. But yeah. your point is important. We've got to avoid any hint of the ad hominem, of attacking right. the person rather than the ideas. And I think it's important to start, like, attacking issues of science, if this, if you're trying to convert a fundamentalist, yeah. and you, you don't want to start by trying to convince them God's not real. Yeah, I right, think that's right. a bad yeah. starting yeah. point. Mm -hmm. I think if you can convince them that evolution is real, they might on their mm -hmm. own come to the conclusion yeah, that yeah. God isn't real. Mm -hmm. Of course, that's what happened to me. So, of course, I think that... Yeah, um, you know, it occurs to me that um, one of the really ancient methods of argumentation that was ultimately extremely successful and useful, and I sometimes when I'm on my best behavior, <laughs> try to use myself. And, and this is the Socratic questioning sort of a right. thing. So instead of saying, well, no, you know, there is no God, there is no whatever, the Bible is hoax, ho hokum, uh, instead of saying, well, now, why do you believe in the Bible? Uh, wh well, or more specifically, uh, why do you believe that the earth is only 4,000 years old? 6,000. Or 6,000, yes, 4,004 B.C., yes. Right. That's where <laughs> you can see what's short-circuiting in my brain. Um, yeah. and, and then, you know, keep following it up. Well, how do you know that that is valid? And, 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 and do you have any evidence uh, to show that and so on? But to keep doing this in as innocent a way as you can manage... Right without sounding threatening and that's very difficult to do when you're it dealing really with things is. that are so especially when a, I would say a lot of fundamentalists likely believe that people teach evolution specifically yeah. to spread atheism. Yeah, yeah. My yeah. sister in law said something to me to that effect once. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. why she thinks people teach evolution. 
Mm -hmm. And that's really why I keep recommending, well, another reason I keep recommending this. Yeah. And yeah. not, I've never recommended Jerry Coin, partly because I've never read him. <laughs> <laughs> I need to finish that chapter. book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but when it comes to recommending books to fundamentalists, mm -hmm. recommend books by Christians. Yeah, yeah. Because they're more, those books are safe. <laughs> They yeah, can read yeah, those yeah. without it being, oh, this author is just trying to make me lose my faith. Right, 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 yeah. That's I mean, point. Kenneth Miller might still be mis misled by Satan, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's less likely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, let's get back on to the problem of evil. And why is that important? Why was that important for you? And well, <laughs> I'm going to start with something that happened most recently. Most recently, to do with the problem of evil, or really this is also related to intelligent design, I learned that there's a species of newt, and that that particular species of newt is called the sharp-ribbed newt. Its defense mechanism is to stick its ribs out of its own sides to stab the attacker. Oh my goodness, I've never heard of this newt. It's horrifying. My gosh. <laughs> I cannot believe in an intelligent designer that cares about its creatures <laughs> that would make that. <laughs> <laughs> or how about parasitic wasps? Those are my well, favorite. Well, yeah, ones. that too. I just <laughs> I just learned about the sharp rib newt within the last week. My gosh, <laughs> I've never heard of this, and I thought I knew all the newts. Uh, but where where does this thing live? Oh, I don't remember. Okay. I that actually works. don't know if I learned that near okay. water. Well, yes, okay. <laughs> Most needs live near water or right, in water. Right, but they have to. Yeah. But yeah, that was... And its skin apparently re heals itself sure. really fast, yeah. mm -hmm. but still, yeah. it stabs its own ribs through its side. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, um, but anyway, the, the problem so, of evil... And the reason I bring that up in relation to the problem of evil is that's an instance of suffering. Yeah. That's an instance of self-inflicted suffering mm -hmm. when, if there were a god designing it, God could have given it a better defense mechanism. Wouldn't you think, yeah. Like, not every species of newt has that. No. Obviously, yeah. there's better options. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or at least less horrific options. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so you have to kind of think about, well, there's all this suffering in nature. There's... Lions have to kill antelope to survive. Mm -hmm. Antelope have to, well, be killed by lions. Yeah. And if lions don't kill the antelope, then, yeah. we'll be overrun with antelope. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and just, there's so many things like that. There's, like you mentioned, the parasitic wasps. Yeah. Parasites in general. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. There are so many instances out there where you know, just one nature of the things. Terrible. One of the things I've always been fascinated uh, with was um, how did Noah get all the parasites together to take them on the ark? Right? Noah and his family must have been really, really sick. There's just no other way. I mean, just think of how many different kinds of tapeworms those eight holy people had to have in them. Yeah. Uh, or, like, maybe it was just a few ancestral tapeworms. Yeah. Which is what Ken Ham believes. Yes, yeah, just the tapeworm kind. You know, right. I, I like to apply that to the beetles, the beetle kind. If uh, Noah only took one type of beetle on, on the ark, and if that, was, that flood was 2348 BCE, um, then that means that to get to the million species of beetles which we have today, evolution had to be going way faster than any evolutionist has ever suggested. Right. In, in fact, I did some calculations <laughs> that evolution in beetles would have to be going so fast that they would have to be evolving faster than the generation rate of <laughs> the generation Which is obviously period. impossible. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. It's, it's really, really very amusing. But... Um, 
and there, there are, of course, two types of evil we can classify, human evil and natural evil. You right. know, you're talking about natural evil. Some people say uh, tidal wave tsunamis and, and earthquakes uh, are the same category, natural evil. Right. And why would God allow that? Um, I don't know. Do you? <laughs> why would she allow that? Right. Well, I would say it's because it doesn't exist. Okay, but, <laughs> okay. Um... One of the things is there's uh, there's billions of years of suffering in the fossil record. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Billions. Yeah. Like with a B, as somebody would say. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> billions and billions. <laughs> and it's, if you think about that, and you think about, oh, well, there was suffering among... Every species that had ever lived, I guess. I don't know if we can count that bacteria suffered. No, well, <laughs> no, probably not. We'd have to stretch suffering a bit, I think. I think, think. so, yeah. Um, the dinosaurs, maybe, though. Sure, sure. And those lived... The T-Rex was closer to living Cleopatra than the Triceratops, I think it is. <laughs> 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 they lived for a really long time. Yeah. Um, of course, you know, it occurs to me that the Adam and Eve story uh, is used to try to account for human evil. Right. The origins of human evil. And, like, to an extent you can see, like, oh, well, I guess free will, if we truly did have free yeah, will, yeah. we would have the power yeah. to cause great evils. Yeah, yeah. But on the other hand, there's the question of, like... Well, if there were really a god, if there were an omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent being out there yeah. capable of preventing, say, child rape, and he doesn't do it, that being is evil. Because if I refused to prevent an instance of child rape that I was capable of preventing, that I knew about happening far enough ahead of time that I could prevent it, I would be evil. Yes, yes, <laughs> absolutely, yeah. And, you know, you bring up a very interesting point. Because not only would you do that, but every Christian I've ever met right. would do that. And Any person with any morality yeah, would do that, and, and, I would think. And so what that really means... <laughs> Even pedophiles yeah. might yeah, do sure. that. Yes, yes. And so <laughs> what that means, and what I love to tell people, believers... If I get to know them a little bit, I say, you know, you are definitely morally superior to the God you worship. Right. <laughs> and isn't that true, though? I mean... I think so. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, you know and that's maybe... Just, we... That's just focusing on things that we can know happen yeah. today. Well, right. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. all the horrific stuff in the Bible, I mean, yeesh. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, really, it's it's pretty horrific. Uh, I uh, was on the road to atheism by reading the Bible, of course, all of the massacres and the genocides and right. and, and all of that. But uh, that, again, you know, I was superior to the God I was worshiping. I was right. morally superior to the God I was worshiping. And really, if anybody tried to justify the Holocaust, yes, yes. You would mm. never want to listen to anything that person said again. No, no. But people try to justify the genocides that are in the Bible sure. all the time. Well, and you I know, think those, some of them might have been worse. You know, <laughs> <laughs> those those Canaanites, uh, they were idol worshippers and they practiced child sacrifice. Right. And if we hadn't killed them off, they would have just had more children, and then their children would have been doing that. Right. So you know, we had to stop <sighs> it before to, to minimize right. the evil. We had to massacre all the Canaanites. Right. And if somebody tried to make that argument about the Jews, you would say they were insane. <laughs> well, the Jews were poisoning the wells. Is that a real thing that happened, or is that just what Hitler said? <laughs> no, that, <laughs> that was the slander through the Middle Ages, that the, oh, the Jews right. were poisoning the wells, they were sacrificing Christian children, and, and various other outrageous right. things. But poisoning the wells was one of the... <laughs> more inflammatory slanders against the Jews that, that right. were used in medieval Christianity. Yeah. 
So that was the reason I said that. It was, it was uh, a failed yeah. attempt at sarcasm. <laughs> uh, Rebecca, I know you have a blog. Uh, before you tell us uh, about your blog, uh, is there anything else that you really would like to tell our viewers? I mean, it's all yours, whatever, whatever you really would like to say. Well, another thing I would like to add about my story in particular. Okay, yes, please. Um, intellectually, the journey was very easy. Like, it was basically, oh, evolution is true. Huh. A couple months later, well, that, that really does mean God doesn't exist. I guess I'm technically an atheist now. A couple years later, oh, that's what polygenism is? Catholic <laughs> Catholicism can't be true. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But emotionally, there you the go. journey was super difficult. Yes. Because losing God, for me, I think is, and I haven't lost my father, thank goodness, but... I think that when I do, it will feel emotionally a lot like losing God did. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because even though I know intellectually he was never really there to begin with. Yes. It felt like I was losing a father, a brother, and a spouse all in one. And because I, that's, brother and spouse is creepily the relationship Catholics have with Jesus. <laughs> sometimes hmm. which in retrospect is really creepy <laughs> yeah but at yeah. the time it just seemed normal and it took me a couple of years to even realize how emotionally distressing that event was mm -hmm. because it a couple of years later it was that i realized oh i feel like god abandoned me because emotionally that is what happened. Mm -hmm. And like I would never I would never say like that sort of personal problem evil is the best reason for not believing in God, but emotionally it's the strongest cuz personally I went through an experience where I needed this person I needed him right then. Mm -hmm. I needed him desperately. Mm -hmm. And he wasn't there. Yeah. He just ignored me. Because, <laughs> like, it was... I actually still remember the date. November 14th, 2010. I prayed. I call it my last prayer, even though it technically wasn't. Yeah. It was the last serious, I sincerely yeah. believe mm -hmm. God <clears throat> exists when I'm starting out prayer. And I was like, God, I, I can't keep trying like this. You have to help me, or I'm going to fall. Like, if you want me to be Christian, help. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I, I believed that if God existed, he would. Mm -hmm. And there just hasn't been any answer. Yeah, yeah. It's been almost five years now, I guess. You see, um, religions in general uh, train people into dependency. They do. And um, Eric Fromm, the psychiatrist, uh, wrote, uh, of course, The Art of Loving is his most famous and popular book, but the most important book, in my view, that he wrote was called Escape from Freedom. And it dealt with the Holocaust and, and things like that also. But the take-home lesson was simply this. When ordinary people and even extraordinary people have to make their own decisions there is always a certain amount of anxiety that accords that, that goes along with that. And um, because we know we are fallible. Right. And especially if the important, if the decision is important, uh, the more important it is, the more anxiety we have when we have to make a decision about yeah. to do this or do that or not right. do that or several possibilities and so on. And so it is much easier to give ourselves to some other authority to make the decision for us. Or at least pretend that they are. Well, oh, well yeah, yeah, no, no, I mean, <laughs> if we really are a true believer, we do. We, we believe right. that the priest or whoever is, right. is calling the shots does know what the correct answer 
is to whatever. And I was thinking about like oh, I prayed about it, and then God told me. Well, yeah, but what answer. was happening is this is, the, this is the collective opinion of the environment that you were reared right. in, uh, all of the priests, all of the nuns, all of the whatever, your right, parents. Right, exactly. But they, they yeah. are inculcating this at a subconscious level as well as conscious level, and so in your prayer, it is still going to be this group speak that is, quote, answering you right. and telling you to, what to do. And so you, you, it diffuses your anxiety. You, you, you give your anxiety to somebody else. And so this That's is... That's actually exactly what Christians say they do. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> sure, yes. And um, this is uh, very, very important in practical terms. Um, you know, especially, and this is why in, in uh, warfare, um, it's so important uh, to the governments that their troops be believers so that they will go fearlessly into battle with no anxiety. Yes, to go fight, this is the correct thing to do because Jesus wants it or God yeah. wants it or the Pope wants <laughs> it or, or, you know, whoever. Right. And so... Without anxiety, we go out to fight the genetic opposition. Right. <laughs> and so uh, this, this is very important, I think, uh, for, for us to keep in mind. Okay, anything else that you want to say before you tell us about your blog? Well, that was very important. I'm so glad yes. you added that. Yeah, it's, it's also, it, I think it's another thing to keep in mind. If you have a friend and they're searching and they're leaving religion. They need emotional support. Boy, do you know it. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. I had very little because right. I had very few people in my life that I was comfortable going to. I was afraid to go to Catholics because, well, what if I'm wrong? Yeah. And what if I convince them I'm right and then they yeah. go to hell and it's my fault? Yeah, yeah, exactly, <laughs> yeah. And I was afraid to go to my family because, well, they, I knew they had a strong influence over me, and I didn't want to change my mind to believe something false. Right. Just for, just for family. And I still don't, mm -hmm. which makes dealings with my family pretty rough sometimes. But I think things are finally starting to get better. And I've only been out, like, almost three years, mm -hmm. so... For people first coming mm -hmm. out, that's yes, that's yeah. important to keep in yeah, mind. Yeah, just just right. wait. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. It, it took a long time in my own family. Um, uh, my uh, mother became an atheist um, about twenty years after I did, <laughs> but she did, you know. Yeah. And uh, it, it took a while and. Uh, many of my aunts and uncles disowned me at first, and ultimately, there came there back. were a few months where I was not allowed at my brother's house. Mm -hmm. Luckily, that ban was lifted because he moved into my parents' house. Oh, oh, I see. <laughs> mm -hmm. With his, I think at the time it was five kids. Still my is, goodness. but yeah. That sounds like a quiverful. Yes, my mm -hmm. that sister-in-law agrees with that philosophy I think mm -hmm. um but so yeah things are still somewhat tense um for my most recent birthday my mom and dad gave me a book about somebody who converted from atheism to catholicism <laughs> um I haven't started it yet but hmm. I will read it yeah yeah because that's what you do sure <laughs> yeah yeah, I mean, we, we, we can't fall into the same trap that right. the believers do. Uh, we do have to look at all the evidence. We right. do have to keep Skepticism our mind... doesn't mean only looking at things you already agree with. Exactly, yeah. It means examining everything. Yeah, and, and, and seeing whether there is any kernel of logic or fact uh, in, in these things. And, right, and actually, I wanted to bring up, and I forgot to say it before... Um, there's Catholicism especially. People who take Catholicism seriously more than, and fundamentalist Christians more than the more liberal brands, they 
do according to them base their religion in reasoning. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. There's, it's actually a Catholic doctrine that you can prove mm-hmm. through philosophy that God exists. Well, sure, yeah. Uh, St. Thomas Aquinas. Right, uh, yeah. exactly. And it's, it's something that you need to keep in mind because maybe, maybe you can connect there to start. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Maybe you can say, hey, we might not agree on much, but we both agree on foundational epistemology. Yeah, we both agree that mm-hmm. we should believe based on reason, logic, and evidence. And I was. I was raised to accept reason. I was raised to accept logic. I was raised to look at evidence. And if I hadn't been, there's a very good chance that evidence would not have changed my mind. Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I have a question. Um, And this just popped into my head. Um, There's a fairly new pope in town. And uh, amazingly, he took his name after me. Um, <laughs> and, and I don't know whether I should be encouraged by that or not. Uh, what's your take on Francis? So, honestly, I feel like he was more a PR move than anything. Mm-hmm. I don't think any doctrines of the church are really changing. Mm-hmm. He's just sort of saying liberal-sounding things, and the Catholics are going, Oh, yeah, being Catholic is good. And it's really Catholic teaching isn't any different birth control of all kinds except natural family planning is still considered immoral even though 90% of Catholics in this country use it yeah abortion still considered almost the worst thing you can do acting on being gay is still yeah terrible intrinsically evil is probably what they would call it masturbation is still wrong any sex outside of marriage, Mm -hmm. all of those things, they're still wrong no matter what the Pope himself says. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And the Catholic Church can't change those rules because if they did, it means that they weren't infallible. (gasps) (laughs) Right? (laughs) Oh, my goodness. And I actually, I have a friend who I convinced her to leave Catholicism by teaching her what Catholicism teaches. Uh-huh. She was one of those mostly liberal Catholics who'd been brought up, I think, in Catholic schools. And she, like, knew, or maybe in public schools, but with the Catholic mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. extracurricular classes or whatever. And she, like, called herself Catholic, but she didn't really believe Catholicism, because she didn't really believe that sex outside of marriage was really all that wrong. She didn't really believe that there was anything wrong with practicing homosexuality. She didn't really believe birth control was wrong. She didn't believe abortion should be illegal. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. (laughs) And I eventually convinced her, like, I wrote up a 20-page document. Oh, my goodness. (laughs) Wow. With, like, a bunch of quotes... Well, what started it is we were having a conversation one day, and she said, you know, your family's bad Catholics. And I'm like, how do you mean that? Like, why are you saying that? And she listed a bunch of things that my family accepts. And I was like, okay. I took that list, and I think I added a few things on my own. (laughs) (laughs) And I said, here's where in the catechism, here's where in canon law that is supported in Catholicism Mm -hmm. to believe these things. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. after, and my intention, really, when writing that document, this was after I personally kind of made the switch, but before I was really committed, I guess. I I was still Uh, sort of hoping mm -hmm. I might someday Mm -hmm. return to at least Christianity of some form. But at the time, I was kind of hoping that maybe she would practice her Catholicism better because, well, maybe I can't get to heaven, but maybe I can help somebody else. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, my. (laughs) I think was my logic. Uh Uh And I gave her that document, and then a couple of months later, I found out about polygenesis and that, like, what it really Mm -hmm. means and Mm -hmm. how species actually come about. Right, yes, yes. And that Adam and Eve are impossible. Yeah, yeah. And then, like, the next time we talked after that, 
she was like, oh yeah, I kind of stopped considering myself Catholic after I read that document. <laughs> oh, good for you, good for you. <laughs> well, you know, that's kind of on a more restricted scale, um, the thing that Madeline Murray O'Hare used to say about the Bible she says, read your Bible, it'll make you an atheist. Right. <laughs> so, you know, read your catechism, it'll make you a non-Catholic. Right, and you know. I do think, like, if I think if every Catholic in this country understood what Catholicism really is, some of them might go more traditional, I'm sure. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. A lot of them would leave. Yeah, I think so, too. Because it's kind of funny, I was watching the Coming Home Network for a while, um, just... I don't know why. Then that's all conversion stories to mm -hmm. Catholicism. <laughs> and they had intellectual reasons for converting to Catholicism from some brand of mm -hmm. Protestantism. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Which by and large I agreed with. So that was kind of boring. But they would always they would say several times, Oh, if more people understood what Catholicism is, more people would be Catholic. <laughs> and I have I the exact so. opposite opinion. Yes, yes I think so. <laughs> Because the, most of the people that I know who've left Catholicism left it because they knew what it taught. <laughs> yeah, sure, exactly. So. Well, um, tell us about your blog and what you hope to do with it and, and, and so. what the blog is. And we'll, and we'll, we'll put the, the uh, identification on the, on the foot of the right. picture that people are watching. <laughs> so the website URL is completehistory.me, fairly nice. easy to remember. Um, really what I hoped to do starting out and what I hope to get back to is arguing against positions in Christianity and showing why that is a problem with real religion instead of a good thing. <laughs> um, I also did a series, I went through a list of 20 different of the philosophical arguments for the existence of God. And I basically said, here's the fallacy, here's why this doesn't make sense. I think I actually found either two fallacies or that it was based on bad science for everything on that list. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and that was, I think that was a really good exercise for me. I think it's a good exercise to go through once you're sort of, for people who've completed their deconversion mm -hmm. process, mm -hmm. I think that's a good exercise to just, just say... Oh, okay. I've calmed down some. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. And now I can see. I can see what's wrong with these arguments. Oh, very good. Okay. So. Well, Rebecca, thank you so much for being on this program. This has been really enlightening to me. Yes. I thought I knew you, but now <laughs> I really know much more about you. And I... Oh, and also on my blog. Oh, yes. Also on my blog, I read books, mm. and I give my perspective as an atheist. Ah, okay. I actually read this one. Okay. On there. Finding Darwin's God. Mm -hmm. Yep. And I, from that more recent reading, would say, while I recommend this book 100% to fundamentalists, I actually really don't recommend it to skeptics or atheists. No, no. Because no. it's kind of condescending to our group. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, thank you, Rebecca. Yep. And that will bring uh, this program to its conclusion. Uh, for American Atheists and American Atheist Press, I'm Frank Zindler. See you next time.